Okay, let's take a moment to go to prayer and then we'll get started. God, as we come before you today, there's a whole lot of things on our mind and heart. Just this world that we're living in is, it seems to be constantly bombarding us with problems of one kind or another. Between the society's um, tendency to just be going in ungodly directions and all the other things that are going on around us, we do end up coming to you so often. We need your help so much living in this world and facing the things that come up day by day. Thank you, God, that you're always there. Thank you that you've promised that you never leave us nor forsake us, that you love us through every circumstance, even when we fail you, that you promise forgiveness for the moments when we fail, if we simply come to you in repentance and ask you to forgive us. Thank you that we have that. Thank you so much just for the way that you love us. Your love is so far beyond anything we can understand that it, it's always overwhelming when we, have, when we come to thinking about it and the way you watch over the details of our life. Thank you, God, for each person that's here today. And as Dan mentioned, thank you for the faithfulness of this church family, God, for all of these people who love you, love your word, and want to be around other Christians and want to be serving you to the best of their ability. Thank you, God, for these folks. I pray for them, each one. I know each one has problems. It's just the way it is in this world. And I know that they, some of them are facing some pretty difficult things. I ask you, God, to intervene in each of their lives in the way that they need, whatever it is for today and for the days to come. I do appreciate and I do praise you for the way you prepare us for things before they get to us, the way you work in our hearts to have us ready. But Lord, I ask especially, as we face difficulties in the week to come, help us to be reminded of your constant presence, of your constant care and love for us, and help us just to be strong in the faith and just in trusting you no matter what comes up. Thank you, God, for all you've already done for us. Thank you for just the kind of God, the God that you are. What a wonderful God. Lord, as we look at the things that are around us, it's easy to get discouraged or even afraid sometimes. I think about our president and our national leaders. Our president has been diagnosed with COVID-19 and his wife. Lord, I know he's ill, so I pray, God, that you will strengthen him and protect him physically and his wife. But I pray for him as a leader of our nation and for each of the other leaders, the ones that are trying to serve you to the best of their abilities and even the ones that are going in a totally different direction. They all need you. They need your guidance. They need your strength. And I know you can work through anyone, even the ones that don't want to be doing your will. And so I bring them to you. And I ask you to please guide our nation into a better path. And help us to be more the kind of country that worships you and strives to please you. We're a long ways from that right now, Lord. We need your help. And you can do it. I know you can. You have that capability. I don't know what your plan is for us right now, but I look forward to whatever you're going to do, and you know what we would like. We would love to see this country come back to serving you. Lord, I think about today, right now, as we gather here around your word, and I ask you to help as we look to you. I ask that your Holy Spirit will guide what is done so that we are drawn to you, so that we can worship you and honor you and give you praise for all that you are in all that you do. In Christ's name, amen. Okay, as we look at the crucifixion, I gotta tell you, I don't know how in the world in the next 20 minutes or so, I'm gonna do a worthy job of talking about what Christ did for us. And of course, having the communion afterwards is gonna be great because it's a reminder to us, but that's what it's for. God gave us the communion service to be a reminder of remembrance of Christ's death on the cross to take our place, the propitiation for our sins. And that's what we're going to be looking at. We're going to look at the actual events 
and I'm not going to be able to cover them all. I think you know that each of the four Gospels records the crucifixion, but each one focuses on certain other certain events and leaves out others, so that you got to look at all four Gospels to get everything in there. And there is so much that took place in those six hours that he was on the cross. It is incredible. But the most important thing is just the fact that he was there for us. That he didn't have any reason for these people to crucify him. He was there because we needed a savior. And he took our place. He died on the cross for us. That's what it's all about. Let's look down now in Luke 23. And we're just going to look, starting down in verse 33, where it covers what Luke has to say about this. I'm going to read from 33 to 37 to get started. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the malefactors, the two thieves, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And the people stood beholding. And the rulers also with them derided him, mocked him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself. If he be Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar, and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. I'll stop there because that covers a whole lot. <laughs> One of the things I want to point out is the very first part of that where it tells us that when they crucified him, actually it mentions that it's when they were nailing his hands to the cross, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Talk about mercy and forgiveness. He's praying for them. These are the Roman soldiers that are nailing him to the cross. Now, I have to say that the Roman soldiers probably had no idea what they were doing other than they were putting to death, executing someone that they assumed was another criminal. They probably literally didn't have any idea who Jesus was or why he was being executed, just that he was ordered by Pontius Pilate to be crucified along with these other two. I love what the one thief says when we get down there, just in the next few verses. But before we do, I want to talk about what the, uh, the rulers are saying. Because they say something that was a whole lot more meaningful than what they realized. Verse 35, And the people stood beholding, and there was a big crowd. I guess this says something about human nature. That whenever you look back at the executions, not only in Bible times, but even in, for instance, in England, there's, we've got some really good records of where the um, English, back in the, up, right up through the 16th and 17th centuries, would hang people or cut off their heads or other methods of execution. And they'd have a big crowd that came out to see the execution. Why do people want to watch someone be executed? To hang on the cross and be, or on the, uh, hang on the cross, or to be hung by the neck until they died, or any of these other methods they use. Some of them were not nice. Unfortunately, that was their form of uh, uh, entertainment. It was. It was entertainment. Um, let's think about that a minute. Watching somebody else die is entertaining. Um, I've never, well, I have seen people die, but not in that fashion. Um, I don't think of it as being entertaining, personally. But that was back in the Roman Empire. That was one of the things that they did, like a theater. They would have people put to death in oh, so many different ways. One of the favorite was turning them loose, or putting them in the arena and turning loose lions. I have to say, I've never seen a lion attack a human being, but I don't think I would appreciate it. Have any of you ever watched some of these um, shows on, on the Wild Country Networks where they show an uh, animal like a 
lion pulling down an antelope or a zebra? Um, is that pretty? <laughs> no. <laughs> Even that's enough that I wouldn't care for it, though I have seen it, obviously. Um, not entertainment in my mind, and yet human beings have a natural tendency to, to be fascinated by things like that. That's part of that old human nature that we, as Christians, are trying to put aside. And here, here's a crowd come out to watch Jesus and these other two people be crucified, hang on the cross until they died. Now, I mentioned that Jesus was on the cross for six hours. Six hours hanging on a cross must seem like forever. But the fact is, Crucifixion was designed as a very torturous way to die. People often lived for a day and a half or two days hanging up there, suffocating But in the end. Um, blood loss contributed to it, but the basic cause of death was usually suffocation because you couldn't keep forcing yourself up to get breath and you ran out of ability to breathe. Six hours was considered a short time for crucifixion. In fact, you will remember, it's not in, mentioned in this part, but it's in the other Gospels about how as the day was going on, the Pharisees sent word to the Roman uh, governor, to Pilate, that, um, you know, we've got a Sabbath day coming up that we got to prepare for. Why don't you have the soldiers break their legs so that they die quicker? <laughs> Okay, yeah, that was one of the things they did sometimes when they were in a hurry, break their legs and then they couldn't push themselves up anymore and they would die quicker. Didn't have to do that for Christ because he was already dead at that point. He had already not died of exhaustion or of suffocation, but chosen to die. We'll see that when we get there. There's so much in this simple crucifixion scene that I would like to mention, and I'm not going to be able to mention them all, but I'll mention a few things. But the most important one is that simple fact that I first mentioned. Why was he there? Not for himself, but for us. Not for anything he did, but to pay for our sin. Verse 35, what the rulers were saying, he saved others, let him save himself. If he be Christ, the chosen of God, and in another one, it, it goes on with, if he's really the son of God, let him come down from the cross. He saved others. He can't save himself. Well, you know what? That's absolutely right. He had saved others in the terms of the miracles he did. But by dying on the cross, he was providing a way of salvation for you and me. And if he had come down from the cross, instead of carrying out God's plan, then he wouldn't have provided salvation for you and me. No, he couldn't come off the cross and still carry out what God had sent him to do. I love where he had told back in the Garden of Eden, or in the Garden of Eden, sorry, Garden of Gethsemane, told his disciples that if he wanted, he could have called 10,000 angels to take care of the whole problem. He wouldn't have needed 10,000. He could have called one. <laughs> that would have done it. But <laughs> Sure he could have. You see, what he did was voluntary. It was by choice. He went to the cross for you and me, knowing what he was doing and with the perfect ability to stop it at any moment if he wanted to, but not able to stop it and still do what God had him there to do because of his love for us. That's the greatest thing about what we see going on here that it was a voluntary choice by Christ to save us, to protect us. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar. He mentions other, in another place that the vinegar was mixed with a, um, basically a pain deadening solution so that you would, uh, it was a, a form of mercy, which was sometimes offered to those who were being crucified, not always. Uh, he wouldn't take it. He told him no. He had to go through all the physical suffering that was involved, as well as what's more important, 
and which isn't mentioned in this, but it's certainly mentioned throughout the uh, New Testament, the fact that he was also accepting upon himself, not just the crucifixion itself, but the punishment for our sins. That had to be so much more, and yet I can't imagine how it, what it was like. How can you and I even imagine what that would be? Um, the equivalent of eternal suffering for not just one person, but for the all who are ever going to be saved. I don't know what that was like, but that had to be the worst. And we get a little glimpse of that in the one of the things that he said from the cross, which isn't recorded in Luke, but is in two other Gospels, where he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Just for that one moment that he took upon himself the sin of you and me. It's like God turned away from him. I don't think literally, but you know what I mean, that for a moment he was, he was taking the punishment for sin and he had never sinned. I like the way it's mentioned in one gospel or in one uh, epistle mentions that he who knew no sin was made to be sin for us. It was as if he was the one who had done all of the sins that you and I and everybody else on earth has ever committed. He took that upon him. That's the most incredible thing other than his love for us that he was willing to do it that I ever can think of about the crucifixion. The soldiers mocked him too, saying, if thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. Well, they were just following along with what the priests and the Pharisees were saying, of course, following along with mocking him too. And of course, the Bible tells us that the, uh, both thieves actually started out mocking him. We'll get to that in a minute because the next part talks about that. He not only was being physically um, tortured, but he was also being made fun of, mocked by these guys at the same time. You ever have somebody make fun of you? Isn't pleasant, is it? <laughs> um, sometimes I hear somebody say something about me that I know it's not true. And my first thought is to correct them. Rather loudly, probably. <laughs> Definitely uh, very clearly. And then I have to realize that part of the reason that bothers me includes pride, doesn't it? Um, thinking that I'm too good for that. They shouldn't be saying things like that about me. Oh, well, number one, no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm still a human being, just like they are, whoever it is. So sometimes God can do a pretty good job of reminding me that I'm not any better than anybody else. Pride is so sneaky. It sneaks in all the time. You know what? God didn't have that problem. Jesus didn't have that problem. On the cross, he had every right to feel that he was being mistreated. He was. <laughs> Absolutely. He wasn't, didn't deserve to be there. But he had done it voluntarily. Here's God, Jesus Christ in human form, the Almighty God in human form, who left heaven where he had been worshipped by the angels who are a whole lot better than us in that respect who are holy and they had been worshipping him and praising him and he came to earth to live with you and me to live like you and I that's the, an incredible demonstration not only of love but of humility the almighty God being willing to live as one of his own creations. Here we see him at the crucifixion. They put up a sign. <laughs> this always strikes me as kind of humorous. Remember we talked last week about Pilate, how he really didn't want to have Christ crucified. He wanted to find some way to get out of it. 
but he couldn't figure out any way to get out of it without putting himself in political danger. Maybe losing his job as the governor. So he allowed Jesus to be crucified. He went along with him. But now he tells the soldiers to put up a sign on the cross. And the sign says, this is the king of the Jews. And not just in Latin, which is the Roman uh, language that was normally used for things of a, that had to do with the government. It was in Latin, but yeah, but it was also in Greek, which was the most common national language or international language of the day, which all the merchants used. And it was in Hebrew, which was the Jews' religious language, the super language of the Jews. So in three different languages, he's writing, this is the king of the Jews. Boy, the Pharisees didn't like that one. <laughs> that was exactly what the Pharisees didn't want the people to think, right? In fact, they went to, to Pilate and asked Pilate to take that sign down. And Pilate told them, what I have written, I have written. It stays. He finally had a little bit of nerve there, enough to oppose them to that extent. Tell them it's there and it stays. <laughs> I love that. Pilate may not have been a guy I could look up to in most ways, but I like the fact that he at least took that stand when he did. Verse 39, we start looking at the two thieves. These were people who had died or had been condemned to die because of their actions. They delivered, they, they deserved to be executed by Roman law and by the Jewish law. So we see them, one on each side. And one of the malefactors, I like that word. Do you know what a malefactor means? It means someone who did something wrong. <laughs> that simple. <laughs> it means a guy who did something bad. Uh, in another gospel, it calls them thieves. One of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, if thou be Christ, save thyself and us. He joined right in with what all the mockers were saying. Only he adds a little to it. If you're really Christ, save yourself and me too. But he's mocking. He's not really meaning what he's saying. He doesn't really believe that this is the Christ. And another gospel mentions that both of them both of the thieves started out mocking Christ. But then one of them apparently realized this isn't right because we see down in 40. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? He says, You're on the cross just like he is. And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing amiss. He says, this is the second thief. He says, aren't you concerned about mocking him when we're in the same situation? We're hanging here dying too. And we deserve it. But he doesn't. That's an interesting statement. He realized, apparently, who Jesus was. Now, we have no idea who this guy was. We don't know his background. We don't know if he had any knowledge of Jesus before this day or not. All we know is what he says here. But he said, this man has done nothing amiss. He hasn't done anything wrong. This man doesn't deserve to be here. So he understood that much. But then look what else he says. And then he turns to Jesus, verse 42, and he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. What's he asking for? He's not asking for salvation in so many words. He's not asking for any special treatment in so many words, is he? What he's asking for is, God, when you get to your kingdom, remember me that's all but man that was enough because he realized not only 
that Jesus was God and was going to be in a kingdom. But he says, when you're there, you'll have the authority. Remember me. Just that simple. Not any specific request. Just remember me. Didn't ask for, a, like the two of the disciples did, ask to be seated next to Christ on the throne or something like that. Could have. Wouldn't. And I'm sure if he had asked that, um, he would have gotten not necessarily a yes. The disciples didn't get a yes on that one, but a good answer from Christ either way. But look at what Christ says, and I love it. Verse 43. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Not when I come into my kingdom. Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. I love that. So many people believe, even those that believe in heaven, uh, I ran into a rather large group of them just a few weeks ago. Uh, they are an Adventist group out of Canada that I was talking to in this particular instance, but I've seen lots of people that believe this, that when you die, you go into the grave, your body does, but so does your soul and spirit. It stays there until Christ comes back to set up his kingdom. The Bible doesn't say that, does it? What did Jesus say to this guy? Today you shall be with me in the kingdom. Paul, talking to the Corinthians and talking in a couple of other epistles, say something along the lines of to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. The moment you die, your spirit, your soul goes to heaven to be with Christ. It, there's nothing in between. There is no waiting for years and years, whatever it is. And he talks about how, if you remember the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, he describes how they died and were taken, one to heaven and one to what was basically our, to our idea of Hades, of hell. And he says uh, that the, the one that was taken to heaven, it describes it as being in the bosom of Abraham, and it shows Abraham there with him. Abraham died a long time ago, didn't he? A long time ago, thousands of years ago. He's in heaven with Christ right now, has been, ever since the moment he died. Well, with a little... I, don't, I, I won't get into that. There is a difference when you die, if you died before Christ was resurrected or not, but we'll get to that. <laughs> we won't get into that today. Um, the idea is that now, when you die, you go instantly with him to heaven. Just that simple. Um, that's what he said to this thief today. You'll be with me in paradise. I'm almost out of time, and we still have communion. One more thing, real quickly. Verse 46. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. He died, but not in the sense of dying because he was worn out and didn't have a choice. He cried with a loud voice. That doesn't sound like somebody who's at the point of death, does it? He cried out with a loud voice. And then it says, and having said thus, he gave up the ghost. That's an interesting word that's used for gave up. It's a Greek word that basically means yielded. But it's the only time it's ever used to talk about somebody's death. There's several other words they use to say that the spirit left the body or something like that. But this is the only time it's ever used in a way that it makes it very clear it's by choice. It was voluntary. He didn't have to die right then. He could have lasted, I don't know how long, a long time. But it was time. He said, it is finished. Then he said, into your hands I commend my spirit and chose to give up the ghost. I love that. That is our Savior. He completed what needed to be done to provide a way of salvation for us. 
And now, because we're almost out of time, we better go to the next thing, which is the remembrance of what he did. And after all the things I've said, I don't really have a lot to say in terms of this communion service except one thing. When we get to the actual time to take of the elements, I'll be looking at it from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, one of the familiar passages that talk about what Christ did on the cross and what he did to set up this remembrance. Now to do that, I better come down and get things set up. Now, as you know, we have to set this up a little differently and handle it a little differently than we used to. We will have each of you come down and take one of each and take it back to your seats and then we will participate together. So you may start. Somebody come on up forward and get started. And I will reassure all of you that these were set out for you with all the proper precautions. I know because I was there to see it. <laughs> we are doing social distancing precautions and we have everything the way it's required.
All right, is there anyone else that want to cut anybody off? Very good. When we come together to do the communion service, there are a lot of things that go through my mind, and I don't really know how anyone could adequately express what this is all about. As we looked at the crucifixion, that's an awful good introduction to it because Christ died on the cross for us, and this is a, we, a means that he gave us as a remembrance, just to remind ourselves of what he has done. And he didn't say that you had to do it every so often or a particular span of time. He just said, do it in remembrance of me. Our choice as a church is to do it once a month, which I think is a great way to do it. Um, but what it boils down to is that we as normal human beings are very forgetful, but I don't think forgetful is the right word for this situation. We have a simple habit of letting the things that are going on right now keep our minds so occupied that we don't think about some of the other things that we know and that are important to us, but we allow them to kind of slide to the back of our mind and we don't think about them. That's why I think God has given us this remembrance because we need reminding of what this is all about. Paul, when he was writing to the church at Corinth, said, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. So let's do that. Let's partake. And of course, after he had done that and had them partake of the bread, after the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye, as often as ye drink it, in remembrance of me. Let's drink in remembrance. In verse 26, Paul reminds them, For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. You're showing and remembering about what he did, but you're also remembering that he's coming back, that that's not the end of the story. He's coming back. Thank you, folks. Let's close in prayer. Father, I thank you for our time together. I thank you for this remembrance. As we've looked at what the, this one gospel mentions about the crucifixion, and thought about Christ voluntarily, not only leaving heaven and coming to this earth, but going through what he did on the cross for us. Thank you, God, for a love that great, a love that reaches out to every one of us, for providing us a way simply by confessing our sins and asking you to forgive us, asking you to be our God and take over our lives that we can be saved. Thank you, God, that you care about us. I ask you simply now as we go out of here to bless our day and guide and keep us. In Christ's name, amen. All right. Are we going to forget about the last song? I know Mary is away, so we'll just call it the close of our service, and we'll see you all later. Thank you very much. I didn't notice that one. I'll have to say something.